Uh, we are back. Johnny McGonigal, Bob Flounders, Blue White Breakdown. It is. We're doing this on we're doing this on Wednesday, pretty nine nine o'clock in the morning. And I'm sure if you got if, if you guys are listening in the in the greater Pennsylvania area, you're under siege from rain as well. It's it's been it's been a real, real rainy week. It's going to continue, I think, a little bit more. I hope, hopefully, no one gets flooded. Uh, Johnny and I are going to talk. We're going to talk Penn State spring. It's almost over, Johnny. We're going to. I want to talk about Penn State's wideout group. Two pe- two people uh, in particular interest me. I know you're uh, working on on a story on one of them. If you haven't already posted it, Julian Fleming, but Johnny. It's great seeing you. The NCAA basketball tournament is now at the Final Four, but all of that right now at the start takes uh, a back seat. My man, Keith, a longtime Blue White Breakdown uh, viewer and listener, big Penn State fan. He's, he, he, we, Johnny and I were talking about, I was, I was incredulous when Johnny brought up uh, that there was a, a, a Southern, I guess it's a convenience store, but it's a super convenience store that is known for a lot of different things like in, in, in the south texas florida bucky's and i was like oh, i can't believe i've never heard of this place this sounds like one of the greatest places on earth and johnny went in, johnny you went into detail about why it is an outstanding place keith was listening uh in reached out to me because he knows i've never even been close to a bucky's and he said he lives in north carolina he's going by daytona beach he sent me this visor, this Bucky's visor, some Bucky swag, which uh, especially for for the weekend, these koozies, uh, we're, I'm going to put them to good use when it gets warmer, when it stops raining, Johnny. But it's it sounds like it's like the equivalent of an adult, and you know I'm I'm you know I'm up there. You're you're still a young man. It's like the equivalent of like Disney World for like you know a kid under ten. Bucky's is a place, a magical place. I need to get to. You've been there. I'm jealous, but at least I finally got some Bucky swag, Johnny. That's all that matters, Bob. You have a Bucky's guardian angel looking out for you <laughs> in Keith. Keith, good job. Job well done. Uh, th- this responsibility would have fallen to me next time I was at yeah. Bucky to hook Bob up. So you took care of that for me. Much appreciated. Uh, but boy, Bob, yes, you need to put that. You need to put that to use. You know, especially where. We're yeah. in April now. Uh, oh, I've been wearing it out. I, I mean, I got this about two weeks ago. If you guys yeah. are just listening, you can't see it. It's on my gigantic head. I cannot wear baseball caps. My head's too wide. So he was nice enough to find me a visor. He shipped it up to Harrisburg. So, yeah, when, when, as it gets warmer, I'm going to be wearing it a lot. Hopefully I can – some people in Pennsylvania are aware of Bucky's. I'm just the slowpoke. But, boy, that was a nice gesture, Keith. Thank you so much. If there's any other swag you want to – if you want to ship our way – um, of, of anything, uh, Johnny and I will be glad uh, to take it off your hands. But Johnny, let's let's pivot back to Penn State spring. Let's just start uh, blue white week blue white games in about I don't know ten days, something like that. Yeah. Uh, but we've heard from James. Uh, I heard uh, last night. I think we we really need. Let's just talk about the wide receivers. I think uh, a good portion of this podcast because. Well, it's it's just not going to go away until it gets better, right? They they need that group to step up. They're talented in a lot of positions. There's some talent in the wideout room. It did not go well for the Penn State wideouts and the Penn State passing game overall, other than the tight ends. In 2023, we got a new OC, Andy Kotelnicki. Marcus Higgins is now in his second year as the wideouts coach. Julian Fleming, the Southern Columbia star, uh, from Pennsylvania, who began his career at Ohio State uh, in 2020, is now at Penn State. He is going to be a guy that a lot of people are going to expect big things from. Uh, Johnny, I know, I know you got a story from him, and you got a chance to hear some of the things he he talked about uh, on Tuesday night after practice. Let's start with him. I also want to talk about Keandre Lambert Smith because James was asked about him, uh, and I want to, Johnny, I want to share some of the things that James said about him, but let's, let's, let's start with Julian. What should be the expectations? Will the expectations be fair? What are the, what, what are the re what should be the reasonable expectations for Julian Fleming? Do you think in 2024? Yeah, I think the reasonable expectations is that obviously he's a starter. 
Um, and I, I think that kind of yep. comes with the territory uh, of the pedigree that he comes in with and the experience that he had at Ohio State, never being a number one or number two, but uh, you know, dealing with a lot of injuries, uh, you know, issues with both of his shoulders, having to undergo surgeries while in Columbus, and you know, now he's fully healthy, and now he has an opportunity to fulfill that, you know, that five-star potential, if you will, uh, in a wide receiver room that needed some competition, needed some talent, you know, injected into it. So I think baseline is that he's a starter, uh, yeah. and that you know, in terms of anything more than that, I mean, he could be the the top target for this team. Uh, unless Tyler Warren has something to say about it, but from a wide receiver standpoint, yeah. uh, has a chance to be you know, Drew Aller's go-to target. And I think he has the capability of doing that. Uh, it's early. It's only April. Uh, he enrolled in January. Uh, but judging from what the coaches and players have already said about him and his work ethic, his attitude, you know, in the weight room during winter workouts, and it's translated over to spring camp, yeah. he is seemingly in, in a really good position to provide that uh, for Penn State. And yeah, he talked to, you know, Penn State media for the first time mm -hmm. Tuesday night. Um, I Full disclosure, I was not able to make it up to practice uh, on Tuesday, but our boy Jimmy Brown, uh, your videographer, uh, photo extraordinaire, uh, was able to send me um, what Julian uh, had to say. And it was really interesting. He said it was a smooth transition for him, a natural change coming from Ohio mm -hmm. State to Penn State, which uh, I don't think many would describe it as that or label it that. But in his circumstances, given his recruitment at Penn State, given that he's a PA guy, uh, everything seems you know so far so mm -hmm. good uh, for Julian Fleming at Penn State. Yeah. So, and I, I, it struck me that, you know, talking about uh, spring practice, the blue white game, you know, Julian, Julian, this is like, I think this is going to be his fifth year as a college player. I think I did the math right there. 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023. Yep. Five years. This is fifth there you year. Go. <laughs> but um, I think the average Penn state fan, you know, on a, on a, on a college football Saturday, they're watching Penn state and, you know, you know, Ohio State and Penn State were probably on a lot at the same time. I don't know if Penn State fans are, are familiar maybe with his style of play and with his game. Uh, I don't know that we're going to see much at all of him, you know, in the blue-white game. I mean, if he's healthy, we're probably the – fan, the fan base isn't really probably going to see him until the opener at West Virginia. So, Johnny, just generally speaking, he's a bigger receiver, right, in the 210-pound range, six foot, six foot one, solidly built um, – you know, almost built kind of a little bit like a running back, but um, as far as his style of play, I don't, I don't know if I, I don't think I'm overstepping if I said he's not necessarily a pure burner, uh, somebody like that, but he is a guy. You know, when they played against Penn State, and when I did get that chance to see him, he's he's a guy that could, that could really do damage in the middle of the field. He can make yards after the catch. You know, he, I, I don't know, but if, if you're expecting him to be somebody like maybe Jahan Dotson or KJ Hamler, that's not really what he is. So I'm just curious to get kind of what your thoughts, if you agree with me or don't agree with me. But given his skill set and his experience, what do you think he can bring maybe to the passing game in terms of what he does well? No, I, I do agree with you. Um, and his, his build would suggest that he is an over the middle kind of guy and he's fearless. He can go, he can go over that middle, you know, take a hit. Um, I mean, he's used to doling him out you know, in the running game. I mean, it's, it's tough when you're looking at a wide receiver and you look at four years of tape and you say like, all right, maybe his best quality at Ohio state was him as a blocker. Uh, but he was a very good blocker at Ohio state. And that translates though, that that's, you know, yep. when you catch the ball, you're ready to get hit. You're ready to, you know, deliver one yourself. And uh, I think that is something that Penn State's offense was really missing last year. I mean, you had the two tight ends uh, in Theo Johnson and Tyler Warren, who frankly weren't utilized as much as they should have been uh, under Mike Yersich. But from a wide receiver standpoint, you know, Keandre Lambert Smith was, uh, yeah, I guess if you want to you know, put him in into a category, more of the burner type, more of the, the, the catch and run type. Uh, and then, you know, we didn't really get to see much from Harrison Wallace, uh, Jay yeah. Wallace, you know, with with the injuries that he had. Uh, you know, it, it just never really materialized for Dante Cephas, or even after you know, it was after the West Virginia game that is for Malik McLean. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think you know, Julian adds obviously experience, 
Uh, if you're looking at the intangibles as well, um, you, you know, having gone to a college football playoff, having won a Big Ten title uh, in his time at Ohio State, having learned uh, from Brian Hartline, who is arguably the best wide receivers yeah. coach uh, in college football, uh, definitely one of the best recruiters in college football, Marvin Harrison Jr., Chris Olave, Garrett Wilson, Jackson Smith and Jigba, you know, working in a room with guys of that caliber and that talent. Uh, during his time at Ohio State, you know, Julian said that uh, Ohio State developed him as a man and as a person and that he thanks them for what they did. But, you know, in the long run, he needed to make a change. And he felt that this opportunity at Penn State, after learning what he learned at Ohio State uh, and already learning what he's learned from Marcus Hagans and, and from the staff here, uh, that this is an opportunity that he'll be able to maximize uh, his final year of eligibility. And so, uh, yeah, I know that Penn State is looking forward to seeing him uh, on the field. You know, you, we'll see how much he does in the blue-white game and really how much yeah. new offensive coordinator Andy Kotelnicki wants to show uh, in the blue-white game. But I'm expecting him to, you know, really deliver some big things for this Penn State offense uh, as long as he stays healthy because that, that's been a big question mark for him uh, in his time at Ohio State. Johnny, real quick, just you mentioned the Ohio, you mentioned Brian Hartline some of the receivers that played uh, there when, you know, when Julian was there just real quick. I had, I just, I was just struck spring practice. Did you see Jeremiah Smith? Did you see that thing that Ohio state's getting ready to roll out as a true freshman this year at Whiteout? I mean, good God. I, I mean, they, those, he looks like he just came straight out of the lab at eight. He, he, there's no way that kid's 17 or 18. He, he looks like he's about 25. He's already lost that stripe, whatever they do, the thing for freshmen that shows he's ready to play. Um, I just I just saw him running around, I think, at, inside the Ohio State uh, practice facility. And I'm like, they did it again. They just keep doing it. Like, how do they keep just finding this, these, these guys? They lose Marvin Harrison this guy comes walking through the doors and it just looks like, whoa. So I know it's a Penn State podcast, Johnny, and I know you know about this guy, but Penn, Penn State fans, um, Ohio State's on the schedule. You, you, Jeremiah Smith is a guy maybe you might want to be on the lookout for early in the fall because he's going to be coming to a stadium near you very soon. And in a few years, an NFL stadium near yeah. you. Know, oh and it's just what Ohio State does, and and you know what? It, it's a position at wide receiver that James Franklin has said it is the position that can really change the game, like in yeah. an and and that's what they're hoping Julian can come in and do, though. Is like that you know, last year, and we talked about this before in the biggest games, the receiver room really didn't show. The, the passing game didn't really show. Yeah. I, I don't want to just put this all on the receivers because mm -hmm. you know they've been under scrutiny over the last year, really, and you know. Frankly, a, a, some of it is fair, but to, just to put it all on the receiver room, uh, you yeah. know, when Drew Aller was, um, you know, going through his first year as a starting quarterback, uh, we have outlined in detail over the last few months the, uh, shall we say, struggles of of the Mike Yersich offense, and and honestly, he was a pretty tightly wound guy too, just from like a pretty um, tightly wound from from a vibe standpoint. You know, it was just like I'm sure those guys were just petrified of making a mistake and that seeps in uh to the conscious whereas Andy Kotelnicki this energetic lively guy who yeah. brings a creative and uh and really fun offense from Kansas I, I think Drew Aller is going to benefit from that I think Julian Fleming is going to benefit mm -hmm. from that I think this entire offense is going to benefit uh from that but they need wide receivers to make plays they can't just rely uh, on Tyler Warren this upcoming season although yeah. he should get uh, he should average more than two catches in Big Ten play, Bob, which is what he did last year. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, very interested to see uh, what Julian does. But right now it's been just a getting acclimated kind of vibe, you know, you know kind of a thing for him, uh, getting to know his teammates. He said everything's going well. It's not like they're treating him, a, a, you know, weirdly or awkwardly because he comes from Ohio State and beat him four times. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, he said, again, he said it's been a smooth transition, a natural change. Uh, and one that he's been really excited about. Uh, one one cool thing too, you know, he was talking about his visit uh, to Penn State after he entered the portal. Uh, you know, James Franklin reached out to him. They rekindled the relationship they had from back in 2018, 2017, 2019 when James and the staff were really recruiting him out of, out of Southern Columbia. He comes on campus for a visit. Uh, he said it was kind of a it was kind of a cool deal to see that nothing's really changed from a you know. Um, 
kind of, kind of just a, you know, the, the facility that the people around, how, how they treat you kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he sat in with a meeting with a Kotal Nicky and Aller, a Kotal Nicky broke down his scheme, showed him some plays and gave him, uh, you know, the expectations for how he feels Julian will fit uh, into the offense. And there was a follow-up question to Julian, like, well, how will you be utilizing this offense? And he just said, you got to wait and see. So we're all waiting and seeing. We're all uh, eager to see what he can bring to this offense. A little tightly wound, Mike Yurcich. Oh, you're hilarious, Johnny. Hilarious. No, I'm just kidding. He was, I think, a lot yeah. tightly wound. Yeah. But I, I just want to say about Kotal Nicky, and I know it's spring practice, and, you know, we had a couple years of Mike Yurcich at practice, and – not necessarily a guy, Johnny, I think you would agree to wear his emotions on his sleeve, kind of, you know, very into practice and, you know, um, you know, watching guys go through paces. Andy, robotic, see, robotic, perhaps. Yeah. Andy, I would say Andy is about 180 degrees different from that. You see a lot of emotion, a lot of passion. What I've noticed early and may, I mean, it, it's, it's a small practice window when we're up there. I don't think Coach Kotal Nicky has any problem holding anyone and everyone accountable if they mess up. And I think that's refreshing, but he has already talked about that. You were up there, Johnny, when he said, you know, I'm a teacher and not that I, not that I want to see a lot of mistakes, but you need to make mistakes at this time of year so I can kind of correct them and we can learn and go and moving forward. And I just think that's the right approach for spring. You know, everyone's, everyone can get better. There are, there's no double standards. No one's above getting maybe pushed or yelled at. And Andy seems like a guy like that. And I think, I think what this offense needs, especially at some of the skill positions, is tough love, if that's the right phrase for it. But I'm eager to see if that will continue and see if maybe even in, in August how that will get this team you know, ready, uh, ready for the fall. Johnny, I just wanted to talk about another receiver. You mentioned Julian as a guy that's kind of built to go across the middle. If you look at Penn State's roster in theory with Tyler Warren and a guy like Fleming, the middle of the field is something Andy Kotelnicki could have fun with. They also, if Harrison Wallace is healthy, they have a jump ball guy, right? A basketball player on the outside that can, if you want to throw some 50-50 balls, take your chances with Harrison. I think he's the right guy. Omari Evans it certainly has some speed to stretch the field. I don't know. If all aspects of his game have been developed yet, they have an ideal, it looks like an ideal slot receiver in Caden Saunders, but we're now in year three and we still haven't seen it all. So I don't know where he is, but, um, you know, Keandre Lambert Smith now in his fifth year, you know, this is a guy, the COVID year 2020 as a true freshman, I'm pretty sure he started a few games and I think he started that first game that lost at Indiana. So Johnny, real, just real quick, because uh, Audrey Snyder of The Athletic asked James about kind of where Keandre Lambert Smith is this year, kind of how his spring's been going. And <clears throat> I, I, I'm going to paraphrase. I'm not going to read the quotes verbatim, but I just want to know if you've heard any of this before, Johnny. He's shown some real flashes this spring. James said he's seeing them on a more consistent basis. He's encouraged by what Coach Kotal Nicky and Marcus Higgins have been able to do with him. And then we need to we need him to have a big year, expect him to. We've seen more consistency. Johnny, um, if you're in year one or year two or maybe even year three, I think you hear that uh, in spring about a receiver, you're pretty encouraged. Year five after the way that Keandre closed 2024 when he caught two passes in the final four games combined. Uh, I know, I know we kind of referenced this last year about guys needing to step up at wide out and to hear that again after what they went through last year. I just, I, that's just not what I want to hear from James uh, about a receiver like Keandre Lambert Smith in his fifth year. And I was, it just seems like it's I don't want to say more of the same, but I don't. I just don't know that James is a guy that's playing possum with this. I just feel like he's still. I, Keandre might still be the same guy, and if that's the if that's the case, I don't know. I don't know where that kind of leaves his Penn State offense. Yeah, and and who knows where it leaves Keandre Lambert's yeah. future? Because yeah, look, I, I mean, th- there's no denying that there this team is going to lose some players to the transfer portal. 
Uh, you know, they are what I, I think they're 99 scholarship players right now, and they got to get down to 85 by the fall. You might see some, uh, you know, some medical retirements or, you know, medical scholarships go out to, to kind of, you know, help that number get to where it needs to be. Um, but there are going to pl- be players that will depart this program. Now, I'm not saying Keandre Lambert Smith mm-hmm. is going to leave, uh, but you know, at the end of last season, just consider and, and keep in mind how you know it went for him down the stretch. Like you mentioned, Bob, two catches in the final four games. He had one target in the Peach Bowl, which was a drop. Uh, I, I remember you know asking him or trying to talk to him after the Peach Bowl in the in the you know media uh, availability in the locker room. And he just said he wasn't answering any questions. So he, you know, look, he, he and this is not me coming down on him, right. but, you know, he, he disappeared in more ways than one uh, down the stretch. And, uh, you know, a lot of people were hoping that he would be the team's, you know, top dog, you know, the yeah. top wide receiver. And he was from a statistical standpoint. Um, but, you know, you, you look at the Indiana play uh, that he made and the West Virginia play, and there was a couple games in there where he had five or six catches and was able to move the chains, but it just wasn't consistent enough, uh, you know, for an offense that really needed someone uh, to step up and, and take control and take the reins. Uh, and so, look, I'm not I'm not discounting the fact that he could do yeah. that uh, in this fifth year. Maybe James is using that a little bit as a as a fuel uh, you know, to his fire, maybe hear, hearing that, you know, he'll, he'll uh, you know, just continue to, to grow and get better. Uh, and maybe Andy Kotelnicki's offense will bring something out of Keandre Lambert-Smith that he didn't have over the last two years uh, with Mike Yersich calling the plays. Um, but but we'll just, just keep an eye on Keandre's situation, right? Because you have Julian coming yeah. in or already here. Uh, you know, you still have, like we mentioned, uh, you know Harrison Wall or Harrison Wallace. You've got like Caden Saunders and Malik McLean could, you know, come back into the fray. Uh, you got some young receivers that are all vying for time and pushing for time. And as we talked last week, Bob, about you know James wanted to see some separation from the pack. So um, and so you're not seeing that yet from the wide receiver room. Mm-hmm. I'm really just intrigued to see you know what kind of uh, you know spring Keandre ends up with. Uh, the portal opens on on, on April fifteenth. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be wondering if he will test the waters or if he is really at Penn State uh, yeah. you know, for his fifth year. Blue-white breakdown, special rainy edition. It is a Wednesday, April 3rd. We, we survived March. That means we survived January and February. See what I did there? Um, Johnny, before we wrap this up, we're like t- almost 23 minutes in. Again, thanks to Keith for the Bucky's gear. Also, let's just right now. Let's just give, how about if we give our guy Jimmy Brown a shout out, not only for all the stuff that he's done, uh, got you some good video. Um, he, he puts together some of these podcasts, does a great job. Uh, our, Joe Herman has kind of been on the DL since the end of the season. Uh, he's on the mend. He's doing great. Jimmy Brown has done a fantastic job during spring uh, and earlier doing video and photography. Jimmy, I know you have to. I know you have to listen to these. Maybe you want to listen to these, but I know you have to. We just want to, Johnny and I, just want to say we really appreciate all the stuff you do. Uh, thanks again. Uh, always enjoy riding up to practice with Jimmy, Johnny. Before we go, though, I think on a couple different fronts, though, because it's Wednesday and tomorrow is Thursday, and hopefully this will be out in time. Maybe we need to talk a little about Penn State quarterbacks, not necessarily Drew Aller. And Bo Prabula, but there's been a little bit of a shakeup. I or there's a little, there's a little bit. Of, I shouldn't say shakeup. There's been uh, an injury uh, situation that's broken out on the depth chart, and also on Thursday. I don't want to date this podcast, but I'm hoping this it gets out in time. There's going to be a prominent quarterback uh, that's going to make a college decision, and it could involve Penn State. Definitely, Bob. Yeah, let's start with the the injury bit of this, and it's something that you know I alluded to. Uh, in last week's podcast, uh, Jackson Smolik uh, will be out uh, with an injury for a quote unquote significant amount of time. Uh, there was a report from on three that came out uh, last Friday. Uh, and you know this it's not necessarily a surprise if you were reading between the lines of what James Franklin did and didn't say uh, at last week's media availability. I asked him about how the young quarterbacks um, have been developing and progressing and performing, you know, in the winter and spring ball. 
Uh, he talked about Bo. He talked about Drew. He talked about Ethan Gronkmeyer, the 2024 early enrollee, uh, who's been doing a, a great job by all accounts so far. He did not mention Jackson. And so it was like, okay, well, is he hurt? Well, he is. So Jackson Smolik, uh, at the very least, out for the, you know, the, the remainder of spring ball, could you know, potentially miss the 2024 season, in which case – Ethan Grunkmeyer as a true freshman would be your number three quarterback uh, if anything were to happen to both Drew and Bo. So just keep that on the radar. Um, that's something to know as we move forward, uh, pushing towards the 2024 season. You mentioned Thursday, Thursday afternoon, Bob, I will be at Spring Forward High School uh, for Matt Zoller's. Uh, your old his- stomping ground. No, that's not, but it's kind of close <laughs> to your not. stomping ground. It's close enough. It's, cl- it's closer than State College, that's for sure. Um no, yeah, it, yeah, it's about an hour away from me, so not bad at all. Uh, but Zollers is, uh, you know, he's a, I think, ranked as high as the number three quarterback in the country, uh, a four star guy, you know, and he is deciding um, between his final four teams. Uh, a t- you know, the twenty twenty five quarterback is going to pick between Penn State, Georgia, Missouri, and Pitt. Um, Pitt finds his way in there with uh, his brother being a walk on at Pitt. You know, he's visited Missouri, he's visited Georgia, you know, he's even visited some other schools down south, some pretty prominent mm-hmm. schools. Uh, but Penn State right now, uh, you know, is certainly in the mix, if not um, the favorite. He's keeping it very uh, closely knit, close to the chest. Uh, but, you know, he has visited Penn State quite a bit over the years. Um, and, you know, he, even going to games, you know, just for fun before he was really a top recruit, because this has been a, a, a quite a rise for Matt Zollers, you know, before his junior season, he had one offer from old dominion and then he lit it up and the offer started really rolling in. Uh, and so Penn state already has a quarterback in the 2025 class and Beckham Kritza, uh, un, under the impression that this Penn state staff would not mind at all getting two quarterbacks in. Uh, the 2025 cycle and uh, Matt Zollers would certainly be a good one. So I'll be there on hand, Bob, for whatever decision he ultimately makes and uh, hopefully able to talk to him, you know, his coach uh, and his family mm-hmm. as well. So uh, looking forward to that. That's Thursday afternoon. Uh, I believe at three o'clock, he'll be making that decision. Awesome, Johnny. We can't let you go. I'm not letting you go. I got, I got a couple more things for you. Not Penn state related. I, it's we're, we've been talking about the NCAA tournament, yeah. not a lot, not a lot, but we've we've kind of mixed in a little here or there. There's been some good and bad gambling advice along the way, but hey, that's just the nature of the beast. I mean, there's been upsets and surprises throughout this. We're now in the final four, two games Saturday. We got uh, we we got UConn, Alabama, NC State, and Purdue from the Big Ten in the semis. The winner goes uh, to my, I got goes on Monday. I got two gate. I got before you give out any advice. I just got two questions for you. Yeah, <laughs> having seen Alabama play defense in this tournament and seeing what UConn can do when they're playing their A game, how many points? What's the over under on just the amount of points that UConn scores in that game? That's my first question. And in the battle of the big guys in the other game, Purdue and NC State. The big man from NC State versus Zach Eady. How do you see that playing out? You can take them in any order you like, but to me, those are the two questions that I think uh, the blue-white breakdown audience desperately needs to know your uh, your input on. Okay, so first I will issue an apology for last week. <laughs> and I said, though, I'll, I'll say this. I said, fade me if you want, like, go ahead and fade me because I was on Marquette, North Carolina, Arizona. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? But you know what I did, Bob? I course corrected, you know, and obviously wasn't able to to share this with the listeners. But after NC State beat Marquette, I'm like, I am not betting against DJ Burns, our, our beloved, you know, Thick boy. I'm yeah. not, I, he is a, he is incredible. I, I love him. Uh, I would die for DJ Burns. Uh, and I bet on NC state to beat Duke. And I'm very happy that I did. Yeah. because He is, he, he is so much fun. That, that NC state team is so much fun. Uh, you know, for their coach, Kevin Keats to, to go from being on the hot seat, you know, to, you know, going through winning the ACC tournament, getting a two-year contract extension out of it. Uh, and he's racking up the, the extra, you know, bonuses too. Uh, as they continue 
throughout this tournament. They've been a, they've been the darling of the tournament. They've been a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do think it ends uh, with Purdue. I think it's at this point uh, with all the craziness that has happened in this March Madness, we're kind of destined for UConn Purdue. Uh, and I really hope that uh, just from a viewing, like a neutral viewing standpoint, I think it'd be really fun to, to, to have that matchup in the title game. Uh, but yeah. And then in terms of UConn, Bob, uh, their team total is, according to FanDuel, right now at 9.50 a.m. on Wednesday. Their team total is 86.5, and I would be taking that up. I also have UConn Futures that I'm just going to be riding this uh, this weekend, uh, but that is something that I will I will be on. So, again, fade me if, if you want. I mean, if you faded me last week, you would have made money. So, But I will, I will be all over that 86.5. Yeah, and I just think the game in general, I mean, as good as UConn is when they want to play defense, Alabama <clears throat> Alabama can score the ball. They, they just can. They find a way. I think it was their three-point game that really carried them into the Final Four, but they can score in a variety of ways. So I, just, I just know – I know one thing that you, we've been right about, and that is they don't—they don't really care about defense. They, they they, it's not really a priority in their lives. They're just going to try and outscore you. It can go horribly wrong against a UConn team that went on a 30-0 run against a pretty good offensive team in Illinois. So um, those those spreads are both big. I think UConn's like 12 or 11. I think Purdue might be around 10 or nine or whatever. That they're they're big for a reason, but they could be traps. So. If you're gonna bet, if you're gonna bet the favorites with lines like that, um, be careful both ways because they, they. I can see both games being blowouts, but that's a lot of points in both games. I just know I really, really like. I think UConn, UConn's a legit threat to get to 100 in this game, and if the totals like in the low 160s, I, I you can fade me, but I am definitely gonna take a swing at that over. Yeah, the the total is at 160 and a half. Yeah, come on. That's- Reds Come on. Left. Yeah, I, I, I do agree with you, Bob. UConn can just score in so many different ways. I mean, Klingon, when he's on, it's just an easy bucket down low. Cam Spencer, one of the best three-point shooters uh, in the country. You know, Tristan Newton is just kind of the do-it-all guy. And St- uh, Stefan Castle as well can can do a lot of different things for you. Uh, th- this has the makings of you know, Bama, like you mentioned. They don't really care about defense. They live and die by the three, but they have really good guard play. Uh, yeah. And Seals and all those guys. So uh, I am intrigued to see if they can keep up. Uh, but in a game, you know, with big guard play and and that it possibly coming down to that, give me Tristan Newton. Um, I think I think he's going to have a really really big game uh, and lead UConn uh, as is you know seemingly destined at this point. I mean, if you're looking to place a future now on whoever's winning the title, I'm pretty <laughs> sure UConn is like minus two hundred or yeah. something crazy like that. Uh, so I hope if if you were if you believe UConn's going to win it all, hopefully you got it in uh, earlier than today or this week. But um, yeah, UConn over eighty six and a half team points is, is that a is that a pen live squad ride, Bob? I think so. <laughs> it's I'm, I am. Uh, hey man, pace, pace makes the race right. Like I just think the pace is right, uh, the approach is right. Uh, both teams can get up and down in transition. There might be a couple of a lulls, but you're also going to see some some some. I think you're going to see in a couple of two or three minute spans, these teams combine for 18 or 20 points pretty easily. So if you're patient and it stays around 160, I just don't see, they've been playing this way all year. I just don't see it changing unless I I forget where the final four is. If they're in a football stadium, it might be impossible to make threes. And maybe that's the whole reason why it's so low, but I, I just know that both teams have scored very easily this tournament. I expect it to continue, Johnny. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it, Bob. That's going to be a fun weekend. Um, and, uh, yeah. And, and also of course, Bob, we have Liverpool playing on Thursday, a uh, little midweek Premier League action. So that, that leads perfectly into the weekend. Cause I know, I know you specifically really care about the Premier League. I do. Well, I do. When you give out my betting, you really need to start hanging out with Greg Pickle more. You guys are kindred spirits in more <laughs> ways than one. So I'll leave it at that. But yeah, Johnny, enjoy the recruiting later in the week. Check back with us for Johnny's, uh, recruiting stuff. Plus we got a lot to get to, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be some, uh, player calls this week on for Penn state, a lot of prominent players check back on Penn life for Johnny stuff, my stuff. Enjoy the final four. Keith. Thanks again, Jimmy Brown. You're the man.